I just to give you a warm welcome from Olbo University. I know that some of you decided to travel for a long time to come here, so all of you, welcome. How the course will work will work that you are very welcome to raise your hand, ask questions all along the presentation. Okay, but before going to the technical detail, I have to give you some practical details about the course. First of all, who I am. My name is Andrea Cattoni. I work here as a postdoc researcher. I got my PhD in Italy from Genoa in 2008, Master of Science in Telecommunication Engineering in 2004, and since 2008 I am postdoctoral post researcher here in the Radio Access Technology Group at Auburn University, and I am external consultant in the Nokia Siemens networks. Musician since all my life, basically, and as you can see, doing also not really normal things. <laughs> but why, when a researcher is normal, never. So, I have to thank a number of entities uh, for helping me uh, organizing this course. First thing, I would like to thank Trinity College Dublin and the CTVR. Uh, because I will have a lecturer here, which is Luis da Silva. He's not here now, but he will join later on. And the CLU project, which is uh, one of our main testbed projects in, uh, in EU. Uh, besides to that, the Samurai project that will provide the demo. Please, come in. That will provide the demo uh, uh, on Friday of our testbed, Asgar. And the cost actions, ICZ0902 on cognitive radio and ICZ0905 on techno-economical and regulatory frameworks for cognitive radio. So, once given these uh, credits, I would like to, to tell you which is the goal of this course. The goal of this course is, as I said, to provide an overview on the cognitive radio technology and on the main topics and issues that run around cognitive radio. If you are here to see specific algorithms or specific uh, developments, it's probably not the right course. Because since not all of you work on cognitive radio, because at Auburn University we try to provide the broadest audience possible these courses, it's more at a more higher level. Technical, but a bit, you know, broad view. And in practice, today we will see an overview on cognitive radio technology and some insights on the topics. And then we would like to give you some uh, algorithmic framework with Luis da Silva, some theoretical framework with Petar Poposki, who is uh, another lecturer here at Olbo University, and some ideas on the software for developing cognitive radio in test pets. So the first part of this course will be an introduction, a general introduction to cognitive radio. So let's start with what we mean with introduction. The concept first, a really, really general overview on the main research fields and topics. A bit of history, starting from Mitola, Aikin, and all the, a couple of visions on the cognitive radio con concept on how it was supposed to be and some application scenarios. So, first of all, what is cognitive radio? A lot of people try to give a definition of it. These are something that I selected. ITU, FCC, other uh, regulatory and industrial forums. So, radio system that senses is aware, dynamically and autonomously adjust, uh, can change transmitter parameters, uh, interact with the environment. More or less, all of them have something in common. What is this something? I should have animated it, sorry. Uh, in general, they talk about a radio, pretty obvious, and then they talk about interaction with the environment. 
This seems, you know, something trivial to say, but it's not. Because today's radio, most of the time, do not interact with the environment. So, and then we talk about measuring. This means that they have the environment, and first of all, they measure something from it. Even in this case, it's not always true. And then we talk about decision making. This is one of the most important processes of cognitive radio. Without making a decision, we do not have the cognitivity. This is the one of the main enablers. And then, once we have decision making, they add that they need to do all of it autonomously, independently. They need to do things on their own. We don't need to have someone tweaking the parameters, tweaking the knots, just to make it work. They need to do everything automatically. And this means adaptation. They need to evolve and adapt to any condition in that they face. So we have sense, making decision, and just, and an environment. That is the main principle of cognitive radio. Whatever else, more deep, is just a specification of this concept. So, <clears throat> what can we do with this? Without knowing anything, just starting from those definitions that we got, we almost get to what it is called today the cognitive cycle. If you look at the slide, oh no. Can I go to previews, please? Yes. If you look, there is sense, make decision, adjust, environment, and sensing again. This is a cycle. And this is exactly what the cognitive cycle is supposed to do. Repeatedly, it repeats itself infinitely, because that's the only way for adaptation. And of course, once we have all this initial information, do we already know how to develop a cognitive radio? Of course not. That's out of, out of question. That's not enough. That just defines the main framework, the main structure, the main principle. Even if we have a more, little bit more detailed cognitive cycle, we don't know what to do. We are still missing information. These definitions that I showed you are definitions on paper. They are regulatory. They need to be open. They do not need to provide technical indications on how to uh, implement a cognitive rate. In literature, there are more detailed definitions, and that, uh, these are um, definitions that we will analyze somehow, and we will look to a couple of them. And before going into this specific definition, let's have a bit of history on why cognitive radio was born, because without knowing the history, we have lost in a pitfall. So, the beginning was the software-defined radio. What is software-defined radio? It's basically something where we have an RF processing, we digitalize the signal, and then we have a modem and the network stack which is everything software controlled or software implemented. Let's call a software modem or a software controller that tweaks the parameters of the radio. Why was it attractive and was so a big fuzz years ago about the software defined radio? Because once you have some hardware resources that you cannot avoid, because you cannot generate a radio, purely software radio with no hardware, it's impossible. You need some hardware resources. And then on top of these radio other resources, you can mount on top of it whatever standard you want. Whatever network protocol stack you want. You see, yeah, okay, that's already done in the mobile phones today. Why was it so important? It was because, you know, 
years ago, let's say 20, because sort of the fire radio was out about, about 20 years ago, and 10 years ago was born. 1995. 25, so okay, thanks for the correction. So, I'd say a lot of years ago, so, um, the, to put multiple modems inside one terminal only was not that easy. Just remember that 20 and 25 years ago, the first GSM phones were barely available and were costing a hell of a money. And it was just GSM, nothing mounted on top. Now, of course, we have, since the moves low, the size of the chips shrink it down, we are able to put 3G, GSM, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS. Do you, do you have something else? You can put it, no, no problem. But at that time, no way, no way. If you would have told someone 20 years ago, I want a phone with these characteristics that we have today, forget about 3G, which was not even available, but the, first, the last four, yes, it would have come out to you with a lack. Just to implement the phone, you, you know, 25 years ago, there was the very, very comfortable handheld mobile phone, which was basically a suitcase just for transmitting. So having this cheap development on software only was really, really, really big boom, was really attractive. And it was really a revolutionary concept. <coughs> so why they would have liked to have this multiple stuff? Because first of all, US 20 years ago had CDMA 2000, and there was GSM in Europe. These were the two big booms. US still has CDMA, CDMA 2000 in some, net, some of the networks. Correct me if I'm wrong, Luis. So you are the, the, the American guy. Uh, and besides to that, even GSM was in different bands. So having multiple modems with a basic hardware resource able to do at least these two standards was already something very useful. And instead, we ended up having with quad band mobile phones with basically one baseband processing, but very, very separate filters and RF receivers. So it was not optimized. And the other very, very big boom was given by the fact that they needed emergency management and public service interoperability. Again, this is the typical, you know, earthquake scenario where everything is disrupted and you need to communicate with interforces, you uh, know, firemen and military and whatever. And they have, of course, different uh, standards. And to still today in US, I had a discussion with a friend, they have in each county, city and force, they have different standards. Even in the same city, police and firemen, they have two different standards. Why? It's useless. But still they are having it. Even if they have, instead of adjusting at, at, you know, at the bureaucratic level, this thing, you have a device that manages these things for you, it's way, way easier. And military, of course. It's the, it's the, the typical uh, application. I have a network connection problem. Let's see if it works here. So, now we know why software-defined radio was useful. And once we have this concept of doing things in software, there was some guy named Joseph Mittler that one day decided, OK, I am developing XML for radio systems, so I can easily configure these radio systems just with an XML file, easy to write, easy to code. Why don't we take something which is still software that manages these, you know, uh, XML files and meta languages auto autonomously. Artificial intelligence was and still is big fuzz in the computer science world. So this new radio concept was basically invented, as I said, funny enough, it was not even a radio guy that invented the cognitive radio concept. It was mostly a computer science guy. But while developing software for radio decided, okay, but why don't we make radio smart? And so was the cognitive, cognitive radio concept was born. 
here in the slide you have the reference to the very first paper that appeared, uh, which is cognitive radio making software radios more personal, uh, from uh, Joseph Mittler, and it's dated from 1999. First appearance, and in 2000, Joseph Mittler discussed his PhD dissertation on this topic at uh, KTH. That's it's here in Sweden. So, moving forward, a big, you know, uh, little of uh, bibliographic references. These are five of the main books that I could suggest you. The most uh, famous one is Cognitive Radio Technology by Bruce Fetter, which has been referenced and cited billions of times because it contains a very nice overview on all the different topics of Cognitive Radio. Uh, there are something more related, for example, to XML, this is from Joseph Mittola, uh, or more, a bit more oriented on physical layer or cognitive networks, uh, or otherwise, this is what, one of the latest ones, where uh, Alexander Wiglinski uh, is one of the editors, and it's very, very nice. It's a big, big book, but it contains a kind of deep